Okay, today we're going to discuss the Festo SMS series of AXIS. Uh, SMS stands for Simplified Motion Series. These type of axis at Festo are supposed to replace, for example, a pneumatic cylinder with just end-to-end -end movement. Um, the axis themselves have an intermediate position and in this case this cylinder is being controlled over IO link which is what we're going to discuss. At the time of this video there is a expert knowledge zip file. So if you go to the Festo website, festo.com in your country and you type in a part number of a SMS series, again simplified motion series axis, uh, you'll arrive at the support download area here on the website and if you go and navigate to the expert knowledge you'll see here that there is a Sorry, the, this guide right here, version 1.20 is the latest. It's been released as of uh, yesterday. And uh, when you download this and unzip it, um, so we have a variety of directories in here. We have the app data directory, which includes the application note and I have that open right now. This is what the application note looks like here. I've added a few extra bookmarks on the left, but that's what it is. And then we have just nothing important, just what the add-on profile is being used, like what the version is in the Logix Designer program. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, the PLC IODD files, which are the uh, IOLink description files for the device and in my case I'm using the ELGS ball screw and then the PLC code um, this file right here is what I'm using right now um, I've renamed it just so that it has uh, 1734 4i all in it but it's the same file and these files right here are basically printouts in PDF form of each of the routines so if you look here, it's each one of these routines that's been printed out. And uh, this is the axis I'm using right now. Again, if you look at the application note, all of these axes right here are simplified motion series axis and all function the same way when it comes to IOLink and the functionality of everything. Okay, so other than the expert knowledge guide, you have the technical data and you have technical documentation this instruction manual right here is the commissioning guide you would download this this discusses the uh, the motor that's on the control uh, on the axis itself so this, this is the manual right here then you would have the instruction manual for the individual axis itself. Um, this one right here, for example. And that would look like this right here. And it discusses all the details about wiring and parameters and so on and so forth. Um, details upon details, okay? Because everything is not 100% included in the application note. The application note is meant specifically just to connect to the Rockwell PLC via the IOLink master. Okay, so the next thing is the website still software directory. You have the IOLink IODD files. So you would download this file and I'll show you how to install that really quickly with the Rockwell environment. For additional information, you click on the show more and you'll be presented with quite a bit of information. With the important emphasis being that the version here is used with the firmware version on the controller itself. 
in my case, I am using, well, I have to be online to show you the firmware version, but it's the version 1904.107 that I'm using. Okay, so let's show you how to install that. Okay, to install the IODD file, here are the options. Okay, if I go to the file itself and I download it, I have this zip file, and within the zip file, I have these files right here. Uh, Rockwell themselves has this directory right here. And what you can do as a user, if you have admin rights on your computer, is you can simply copy all the files to that directory with Rockwell closed and then start up Rockwell and then those files will be registered. Um, that's the simple way. Um, the alternative way, well, I can just show you this real quick, is I currently have the older file in here. So I have 2021.0115, which is also good for the version 19 firmware, but this one's a little bit newer. So I'm gonna install that right now real quick, the classic way. So when you have this right here. Ignore what I have already. I'm just going to fake it. Like I'm going to add something here. And there's a register IODD file option here. Then it's going to come up and you have to do the same thing again. Give it a second here. And then we have register IODD file. And then you pick the location. So I've chosen the location and ignore this notepad icon that's not correct I just open XML files with that uh, notepad plus plus and just say open and it's basically registering the file it doesn't give you any indication that hey I'm done or anything at that point you hit exit you go back to your thing here you hit cancel and then cancel okay so that was the 2021.05. So once we've registered that, you can check the version of the IODD file right there, um, which is not correct. So let me just do a refresh here. So you'll see here, if I go back to the directory, we now have both files. So I'm gonna quickly delete this old file And when I go and I open this back up, hopefully it's registered properly now. There you go. So now it's taken the newer file um, and the version. So that's how you register the IODD files. And let's assume that I'm not looking at what I'm looking at right here and I have no access right here itself. So at this point we want to add the device to the project. It's not that difficult. I'll quickly add one on a different rung here. So I'm going to add one to channel number whatever, three. This is the axis. You say create. It comes in. It creates the axis and so, so forth. And then you would say OK. And then it adds it to the device. And now we have this and then you would click on apply. So now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna get rid of that. All you do is click on the line, hit the delete button, and it deletes the file. Okay. So now we've added the device to the channel. In this case, I'm on channel one. And we are ready to go. Perhaps it's also important, well, it's very important to understand this particular IO link master from Rockwell. So I have a point IO, A and T R B. Um, let's just start up our link so you can see the firmware versions of everything here. So the firmware version of the AENTR is 5012. I think there's a newer 6 out right now. Um, 
Poor configuration, nothing specific, nothing else. And then we have the IO-Link master itself, which is sitting on the point IO adapter of the Ethanol device properties. And I have revision 1.011. It's really important to understand this um, because the firmware version of Rockwell determines whether data storage is offered or available or ADC, automatic device configuration from Rockwell as a feature. And right now the PLC I'm using is this one right here. And while we're here, I might as well just show you this. I'm on 33012 firmware. This is my configuration, not a ring, and so on and so forth. So close this. The version when you add the iLink master must match the firmware. So I have a series A 101, and then you enable the ports as you go on through. I've got them all enabled right now, not that I'm using them all, but and then from a connection standpoint, I'm using 10 millisecond requested packet interval, unicast connection, and so on and so forth. And then uh, the next point is to show you the configuration of the point IO. Uh, again, you match the revision. I have rock optimization active, chassis size configured, nothing really of any importance over here and then if you right click and go to the boat module it will show you the add-on profile version which is 20160 this is also important as a compatibility of the firmware that you're connected with okay with this particular 4IIL from Rockwell you cannot update firmware um, as a user, you have to buy a whole new module, a whole new 1734 IOL. And uh, yeah, so they also have a, another IOL like master that is a armor block and uh, it's able to have firmware updated in it. I'll, I'll discuss that at the end of the video. So let's continue on here. We've we've gone through and we've added this device. And you'll see here that data storage is not an option. So we have what we have, okay? No way of connecting a device and having all the parameters stored in the controller or in the iLink master and then downloaded to the device when you change the device. So that's really important from this standpoint that you don't expect that to happen because we have older hardware. Again, I'll talk about that at the end of the video. So we've added this, and when we add that, if you go to the controller tags now, it's called iLink Master. Scroll until you find the point IO, and the point IO, we have the data right here on channel one. And then we have the data, output data right here. And then we have diagnostic event and so on and so forth. Okay, and to further discuss the, the input and output data, if you go to the user guide, the application guide that you downloaded, uh, you'll see here from a process data standpoint, we have input and output data, and we basically got, or we basically have a move in, a move out, a intermediate, and a quit error from an output standpoint from the PLC to the device. And from a status standpoint, we have in, out, move, intermediate status, and uh, the device is ready is the bit three. The firmware I'm using is this one right here. You might notice in the video that I have something newer installed, but ignore that. It's, it's version 19.04.7. And from a standpoint of layout here, we have the 
ELGS ball screw and spindle axis. It's connected I-Link to the point I-O module. The adapter, which is the AENTR series B, is it, it's connected Ethernet IP to the PLC. And from a live standpoint, we have the device right here, okay, which I'll show working later. If you go to the PLC code, I have a process data routine and I have mapped the data, the raw data to uh, the process data, which is basically you need to do byte swap due to the little Indian mm -hmm. and uh, that data here comes through and then I've labeled everything. So from a standpoint of the inputs and outputs, I'm mapping the data to other tags and I have move in, move out, quit error, just like we do in the process data, and then so forth. And when both these inputs here are on, then an error is active. So if we look at the axis itself right now, we have the yellow indicator on, and it's the first time I've connected to it, and we have an error active. I also have a diagnostics routine here. Uh, which is based upon the events of iLink Master. And again, the two inputs show that there is an error active in the process data. And then we have the typical setup for events happening and being cleared. Event disappears, event appears. And if we scroll, we will find that uh, the last error was event 1802. If we're, but at this point we are not even online, so we have to go online next. We'll discuss that. And uh, so, additionally to the process data, we have IOLink system commands. Um, these are not normally required in need to go beyond the scope of basic interaction because it is simplified motion series. I've just given a whole bunch of extra information so that you can overcomplicate things. And in here we have message instructions which will uh, be sent to the device and we have the ability to execute homing in positive or negative movements. We can do a restore factory settings to the device. Uh, enable, disable the power stage. Those are basic things. And then we also have um, things that you might be interested in. So in order to discuss these ones here, I'm going to do a download because right now the IOLink Master, when you're offline, um, do not have the tabs that are here to show you the information. So I'm going to download this to the PLC. Um, before I do that, if you've never downloaded to the PLC before and you need to know, just come up to Who Active here. The Who Active you would have already set up in your RS links. A configured drivers, you would have added a come through here at an Ethernet IP driver, you say new, and then you pick the device. This one here, I added it to there, and I'm connected to my Ethernet connection port, which is on that address. And then once that's there, just like you see here, you have the PC LAN and what's ever connected there you're looking at. When you're in the PLC project here and you go to who, you want to set the project path, you come through here, you select your device, and then you click on set project path and at that point from there on you're uploading and downloading to that same thing. And if you ever want to change it you come back in here and you select a different thing and you would say I'm not going to do that, sorry. Of course you need to select something that's an active thing, it's not even online that one. Anyway, you would select it and then say set path and so on and so forth. So at this point I'm just going to do a download And it starts to download and it had to put the controller into program mode and then when you're finished it'll ask you to put it back into run mode. Mm -hmm. 
now it's in run mode and let's continue here and you'll see here that there's no connection communication has failed done that on purpose I don't have the cable connected right now to the Ionic master but we'll see here that we also now have these additional tabs okay which when you're connected to the device actually give you information so if you go to the diagnostics routine again and you scroll you'll see here that you have a cable error based upon my fault code here and I also have an island connection loss in the sensor of the device so faults are working and at this point I will connect the cable okay cables connected now give it a minute cable error is gone And the sensor lost fault is also gone. Okay, so now if we go back to the point IO module and do a refresh, this should be cleared. And now we have data coming in. Okay, and we have these additional tabs. So again, I have the ELGS. And we're at these positions here. We have this parameter access right here. And we have the diagnostics menu. And the diagnostics menu gives you the last 25 faults or 64 faults. And uh, if you're looking to understand what those faults mean, you can look into the user manuals. And if you go to the user manual, so if I go to the EMCS, I click on the diagnostics and malfunction. So we downloaded this manual earlier. You'll see here that uh, there's error codes, event codes. So all these event codes are covered right here. The LED of the device, this LED pattern right here will match it. And you'll be, under, be able to understand what it's indicating to you as well as like I told you before, the current diagnostics, I've added them as bits, and uh, you can use these bits to manage everything, okay? If I look at this and decipher a little bit of that, and I zoom into that, you'll see here that the 1802, which is decimal 6146, is the load voltage under supply and not connected, okay? So that was a previous event. Okay, so now let's look at the controller organizer and let's move some things around and, and get some motion action happening. If we go to the process value, again, we said we have these state in, state out, ready for operation. So before you can move anything, you need to ready for operation. And Depending on how you start things up, there is a power-up sequence that you need to follow in the manuals. It's very important. And uh, right now, um, let's just look at the webcam and bring it together. So well, this right here is not the best. It's actually a red LED, and I have a fault. So error is active. How do we correct the fault? Well, I should be able to simply toggle this bit, Control-T, and it should reset that. And it did not so let's see here you'll see here that right now I'm getting 1806 error and I don't have a fault code for that right now it is in the manual here 1806 is under load under voltage in the DC link which is the load voltage so I'm just going to quickly add that okay so now I've added this 1806 fault and the decimal value is 6150 and if I was to look at all the event codes, you know, monitor. So I've labeled, so I've added all these things myself and all these labels are myself from the user manuals, okay? So Just get to the diagnostics again. 
So right now I have the uh, the load voltage, which is what this is saying, turned off. Okay, it's been turned off, and I'm going to turn this on now. I'll give it a second here, and if I go back to this right here, I should theoretically be able to click this, and it clears the error now. And this over here changed. You see the LED status changed at the same time, and right now I have a yellow LED. Okay. If I navigate to the user manual to look at what the yellow LED is, we'll see here that the yellow light is waiting for a motion task to initialize the reference and position. Um, so that's basically saying, hey, the reference, because this is the first time ever started up, has to occur. So this is an automatic process. So it, the very first movement after startup, um, it will basically execute the home or reference routine prior to executing the move that you want. So right now, if I want to move out, let's just see what happens here. I'm in the middle stroke here, so we can see what happens. I'm going to toggle this on, and it's going to move slowly over here. And then it will move to the out position. So it, it referenced over here at this end, and then it moved to the out position. And the LED right now is a flashing green, which is okay. And we'll see here that we have status out because we asked it to move out and we're still ready for operation. Toggle this off, tell it to move in, and it moves to the in position. Move it to the middle position, whatever that may be programmed, and it moves to that position. And as you can see here, the state of those positions are reflected. And that's the simplicity of this itself. Now, as a user, you may want to overcomplicate the axis and how you use it. So that's why I have these values right here, okay? So if you are going to never change anything other than using this online diagnostics tool here. So let's just scroll this over a little bit here. So we have the ability to modify everything right here online. Okay, so we have a speed. So let's just modify the speed here so we know that it's working. Uh, speed out has been modified slower. Um, we have a start press position, end position out, and an intermediate position. So the intermediate position, let's make this in the middle somewhere. I'm just going to change it to 50, scroll away, and this position start press is where um, you go into a force mode. So if I tell it to go to the end position out or to the out position, if it gets to this position right here. I'll show you that. Let's put 80 in here. It will move at a percentage of force until it gets to this position. Okay. So I'm going to hit apply. And then I'll go back here and show you the axis moving again. So the move in moves quick. Last time I did a move out, it was very quick, just the same. We'll see here now that it's much slower. And you'll see here that it almost transitioned. Well, the transition uh, was specifically because we said that our target to move out is, is the end of stroke, okay, which is where it's sitting right now. And we said that once we get to position 80, we want to transition to force mode and apply a force of 20% until we achieve our in position out, okay? And that's exactly what it did. So again, I'll move it again. Control T, off. And then it transitions to force mode. Okay. Move it back out. 
and we changed the intermediate position instead of being end of stroke to being in the middle somewhere. So now it stops prior to. Okay. So again, let's scroll this over here. If you just set up the axis one time and you never want to change anything again, you can do everything right from here online and everything is good. One extremely important fact before discussing anything next is that anytime you make changes to these values right here, as a default, the values are being written to flash. And if you go to the guide, the application guide. Um, on this page 26 of 50, it talks about the flash memory, how it's only designed for 100,000 write cycles. I don't know why there's a decimal or a dot here, but 100,000 write cycles. And these are the parameters like speed, force, and position, and intermediate position, that anytime you change those, the system in the background is writing to the flash memory. So if you want to dynamically modify those values while the application is running, um, we need to stop that. Otherwise, when you exceed the limit, all the write cycles, then the flash memory will be destroyed and you won't be able to write to the device anymore. So how do we fix that? Well, we have this in the, the latest firmware. Um, so again, go back to here. Within the latest firmware, there's a new parameter called auto store. It was introduced and that's this right here, auto store active. And I, by default on power up, turn this off. Okay. And you can set it here and save it. You know, it's going to be a true or a false. And basically it stops that from happening. So it, and there's, there's obviously a, a difference. And, and that is that now when you rate those values, it's being stored in the volatile memory. So if you cycle power after this and then turn back on, those values will go back to what they were. So let's try that. I'm going to turn power off and then back on and we'll see what happens. Okay, so power has been cycled. I'm going to do a refresh. And you'll see here that all these values, because I have the auto store, which is writing to flash disabled, that it's now back to whatever was on the flash. Okay, so very important to understand all this and how you want to use the device. And like I said, I have code right now that every time I start back up, writes this to a false, just to make sure. Um, if you have no code adding, acting on it at all, then it's up to you to put the correct value in here. The default is that it is using the flash. So if the user comes through here and modifies this and then cycles power, then anything he's made changes to will be the same as when he cycled power beforehand. So let's talk about the rest of the motion now. So the rest of my code here allows the user to um, programmably modify values that would be a likely thing that they want to change for their application. And again, this is when uh, I turn off the auto store. Okay. So I have the first routine right here, which is right here. And What I'm doing here is using a message instruction and talking to the iLink master and I'm sending a index 265 which is hex 109 decimal 265 and on the first scan I'm actually doing a write to that and I'm sending a zero to that 
based upon how I configure my message instructions here. So I can come through here and I can do a read and it reads the fact that it's off. So I use this status to say, hey, it's not active. That's good. So that's the first one here. And then beyond that, we have speed in, speed out. I can modify these values right now. The speed in, speed out is 70%. So again, this is just using programming code. The right here, this, this, this are all, doesn't need to be changed. That's writing to the message instruction. Uh, the channel number is the channel number being uh, used in the controller. So like I said, we're on channel number one here. So I'm channel number one and uh, simply read and write. And the user manuals explain how to do this. And to understand how to do this, you would typically have to read the iLink master uh, user manual from Rockwell. And it explains that. Um, what I have done is this little routine here. And I've taken this from the Rockwell user manuals and populated this. So the Rockwell automation publication is out right there, 2019, and how to configure message instructions. So if you really want to get into the detail of the message instructions, I'm explaining it right here the best I can. And I have message instructions that are for force, position force, position and position aux. So the position aux, let's just look at that real quickly. Um, if you look at the user manuals again, you'll you'll see here that when you find the parameters that you will find all the information about each individual parameter, the index and sub-index number, and so on and so forth. Okay, and when it comes to position, as I've written down here, if you have a linear drive, there's a scaling factor of 0 0.01, and if you have a rotary drive, it's 0 0.01 for degrees. And so I'm using a multiplying factor here. So if I do a read of the intermediate position right now. The value here comes through as this, and I scale it, and the resulting value is 104.24. There's some swap bytes going on because of the little Indian. I'm all handling that here in the message, but basically that's everything there. And I'm just gonna close the diagnostics right now. Just, just close everything except for this right here. And, and I'll reopen this right here. And I'm just going to show you what happens, okay? So the intermediate position is this routine right here. And I'm going to modify that value with code, okay? So down here, the existing position right now is 104.24, as shown right here. And I'm going to write... 55 millimeters to that. So I'm going to toggle this bit on. I get it done. If I read the position now, it's now been changed. If I go to this right here and do a refresh, you'll see here that it's been modified. Okay, and you have to you can apply or whatever. So that's how the code is manipulating the data in the parameter table and I hope this works and understands in your head. If I go to position actual data and turn this on, we're currently at 2.16 millimeters. If I go to the observation menu here, we're at 2.16 millimeters. Okay. So If we go back to the application guide, there's a couple things that's, that's worth mentioning. Um, Add-on profile installation. 
I showed you that by clicking on this, right clicking, it shows you the version of the add-on profile is 2.1060. Uh, the fact that we have these tabs while online is because I have installed the latest add-on profile. Um, the user guide or the application guide talks about this and where to download the latest things for your software. Okay. If you're a real newbie at Rockwell, this section four also talks about how to create a project and add a PLC and so on and so forth to configure the IP. In this case, this I have a special controller where I can have either dual IP. So I have two IP addresses, one per port, or I can have one address for both ports and I can have a linear device level rating network. Um, talks about adding the Ethernet adapter, configuring the point IO module, so on and so forth. It talks about all this in the application guide. Right here. So process data talks about this all in detail. Um, if you don't know how to add a routine, um, this is how I added the routines. Pretty straightforward. Add a routine, name it, start coding. Talks about the process data, which we have already discussed. And then it shows you the sample code and it gives you the details. So I've given you the details from the user manuals as well as the instructions and some information here for each one of these. So we have that for all of them. And then it also discusses the diagnostics and event codes. Okay, and that's it for the, for the guide. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is the IOLINK data storage options. Okay, I've already showed you that uh, data storage on this here is disabled and that's because this particular IOLINK master, the 4OILL, does not have that in the firmware uh, as far as the feature. So I can't show you the data storage on this particular IOLINK master which is matching the, the application guide. So I'm going to go to a different project right now. I have a another project right now which I'm not going to provide anyone and I have a 1732-8 IOL IOLINK master and that particular IOLINK master here uh, I'm using uh, where is it this right here the device properties configuration so I'm I've updated the firmware, so older firmware again does not support data storage, so I've updated the firmware. That's up to you guys to figure that out from the Rockwell website there, and it's not that difficult. And 3012, and in my project here, again, you have to match the ADO add-on profile, so if I go and I look at my add-on profile, I have 30160 installed which is the compatible version to work with the 3012 firmware. And the revision here has to match the, the firmware. And this is an 8 link master. And what I've done here is I have have both, I have two, two axes in here, two SMS series. Uh, in this case, we're going to continue to talk about the LGS. And... Uh, and look at the differences with data storage, okay? So this particular thing has data storage options. So let's just look at this here. So I can come in here and modify this. Um, backup restore or restore. Restore basically means whatever the device parameters are right now, when you do this and apply this and download, then anytime you connect a device that's been factory reset, meaning a new device is being installed, the, the data will be moved from the IOLINK master, the 
configuration, all the parameters, and download it to the device. The backup restore feature, which I'm going to activate, means that any time we make a change to the parameters here, those changes are being stored in the IOLink master. And then again, going back to the restore method, when you have a factory reset device newly connected to the channel, the parameters that are in the iLink master will be downloaded to that device. So I'm going to activate that right now. Yes. And save. Well, I have to apply first, but. And then I'm going to. Do a download here. So download. Okay, to demonstrate the backup storage, now I will use both these models here. So the ERMS is disabled from a data storage standpoint, and the backup restore is enabled on the ELGS. So with the ERMS, with no data storage, I can come into here and make changes. Hit apply, and if I do a disconnect, um, so I'm going to do a factory reset. So restore factory settings on that device. Okay. And then I'm going to do a disconnect. So if backup data storage was working and I plugged in the new device with factory reset, I connect it and it should go back to the factory default. If I do a refresh here, the values that I had modified to 90% now go back to the default. So the fact that it's disabled, that's working correctly. So now let's look at a device that has the backup storage active, okay? With this device here, I have 20%, for example, right now. So the way the backup storage works is like I make a change right now, and that's being when I hit apply. This change that I've just made here, these changes are being stored in the IO Lake master. And now, if I go to that device and I do a reset, factory reset, and we know that the factory reset default parameters are like 70% here, but it's irrelevant. So I've done a factory reset, and now I'm going to disconnect the old device so it's malfunctioned, and now I'm gonna install a brand new device that has a factory reset on it. I plug the device in, wait for it to power up. What the backup storage, the backup restore is doing is when I plugged in that device, it downloaded these changes that were already in the iLink master to the device. So if I do a refresh now, instead of this going back to the factory default, it's going to be whatever changes you modified here. And whatever changes you modify here, in code are the same thing. When you modify that, that code, it's going to be stored in the iLink master. Okay? So hopefully this really gives you a perspective on everything you can do with this device, uh, a perspective on the iLink masters, a perspective on the firmware of the iLink masters from Rockwell. And uh, that should be it for the video, guys. Enjoy. Good luck.